What is going on guys? Welcome to Tech Savvy Wire. So today I've got a special video for you guys. Now last week I did an upload on a Nintendo Switch and why you should buy that in 2019 and I also did one on the PS Vita and a few weeks before that I did one on the JXD. All three of these devices are pretty solid handheld portable gaming devices in their own aspects. However, I thought it would be a good idea to kind of compare them head to head since I did positively review all three of them to see which one would be the ultimate winner of all. So to help me pick the winner out, I devised a couple of metrics that I'm going to weigh each one of these devices on and they're pretty straightforward. So the first thing that we're going to take a look at is the price and the total cost of ownership. We're gonna look at any exclusive features that the device offers. We're gonna look at its form factor, the technical specs inside it, the customer service and support that you get while purchasing that device, the game library, and last but not least, homebrew and emulation possibilities or capabilities of those devices. So let's take a look at each one of these handouts coming up. Okay guys, so let's jump right into it. We're gonna start off with the PS Vita. So let's talk about the price or the total cost of ownership of this device first. So if you're looking to pick up a used one, you're probably gonna spend about 100 to 150 bucks depending on where you go to get it. And if you're trying to get a new one, you're gonna be spending roughly 200 to $250, just kinda of depends again where you go ahead and find one, considering that these are kinda of scarce to find brand new since they are going out of production. Now, aside from just purchasing the device itself, you're obviously gonna to need to purchase memory cards for it and games depending on your selection. Now, everyone knows that the memory cards for the PS Vita are notoriously expensive and could possibly be attributed as one of the reasons why this was a commercial failure. Now, if you talk about the games, since we are about seven years into the lifespan of the PS Vita and pretty much towards the end of its life cycle, the games have started to get a little bit cheaper depending on where you go and buy them. PSN's digital store will still have the games relatively expensive However, if you do go to a GameStop or you buy them used off somebody else, you can pick up games for as cheap as five bucks, probably going all the way up to 30 bucks. So all in all, I'd say that the cost of ownership for the PS Vita is somewhat expensive, but it's not gonna break the bank incredibly like some of the other devices that we're gonna talk about today. Now let's take a look at some of the tech specs. So the Vita has a five inch vibrant LCD touchscreen that has a resolution of about 960 by 544p. Now that's not high for today's standards, but the screen still looks really, really crisp. Powering the Vita is an ARM Cortex A9 quad core CPU, which has a clock speed of 333 megahertz that could be boosted to 444 megahertz. There's a PowerVR SGX 534 MP4 Plus quad core GPU with a base clock speed of 200 MHz and 128 megabytes of VRAM. There's also 512 MB of RAM on board and one gigabyte of storage built into this slim model. Now the Vita also comes equipped with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, a front and rear VGA camera, six axis motion controls as you saw in the DualShock 3 controller, and a rear touchpad. All of this is being powered by a 2210 milliampere battery that can deliver around six hours of usage on average, which is pretty impressive. Looking at the form factor of the Vita, it has a pretty slim design coming in at only 219 grams. The Vita is pretty comfortable to hold even for people who have big hands and you can actually fit this in your pocket. The controls include everything that your standard DualShock controller would have with the exception of the L2, R2, and R3, L3 buttons as those are being mapped to the rear touchpad. And this could be a bit uncomfortable to play with and as we know, a lot of the developers kind of abandoned the functionality of that. So it's not a must have. Now let's talk about the unique and exclusive features of the PS Vita. So with PS Vita, you can actually do remote play with your PS4 or your PS3 even when you're away from home. The live area custom operating system on this Vita is actually pretty refreshing even after many years and it's really responsive as well. You can also use the Vita as a second screen for compatible games with your PS4 and you can actually even use this as a second controller with your PS4 for multiplayer games. These are all features that you can't really find on any of the other devices that we're gonna talk about today. So how does the Vita hold up with homebrew and emulation? So the PS Vita has really no native support for any emulators or homebrew applications unless you actually hack the device. Now hacking isn't difficult, but it isn't really for the weak hearted and is only compatible with devices running firmware versions 3.68 and below. And that can change in the future, but that's what it's like today. However, once you do hack the Vita, you can play PSP games, PS1 games, Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, MAME, as well as some pretty cool custom ports of iconic games such as Hexen, Quake 3, and Doom. 
Almost every game I tested on the Vita ran at full speed. The Vita is simply an emulation powerhouse. Now the games on the Vita is a pretty debatable topic. However, to date, there are over a thousand different games available for the PS Vita. This includes PSP and PS1 games as those are naturally supported and can be downloaded via the PS Store. So although there won't be many newer games soon releasing for the Vita, there still is an excellent library of games that you can go ahead and start playing today. Some of these iconic games include the God of War Collection, Persona 4 Golden, Uncharted, Drake's Legacy, and of course the Ratchet and Clank series. Games like these alone make the Vita worth every penny. Of course, this is a subjective statement and it may differ among different gamers. Now let's look at the final aspect in measuring how successful or how good this device is, and that's the customer service or support you receive when you purchase this. Given that this product is actually at the end of its life cycle, I don't really expect to get a lot of support from Sony on troubleshooting different things with this or if there are issues in the future. We already know that Sony is planning to abandon PS Plus memberships with free games that you used to get for the PS3 and the PS Vita for both the PS3 and the PS Vita. So if you are a PS Plus member, you're no longer going to be able to get any free games. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't play online or download constant updates for games or update your trophies. Stuff like that will still work, but it is important to know that you're you know, potentially going for a product that is at the end of its life cycle, and so there might not be a lot of support coming in the near future for it. So let's move on to Nintendo Switch, and let's talk about first thing, the price and the total cost of ownership. So the Nintendo Switch is $300 for a new one, and about 280 bucks for a used one. The games are pretty expensive at usually around 60 bucks a piece, with some sales kind of seeing them down to about 45 to $50. So a lot of the games that you see are pretty expensive, and you rarely really see any kind of significant price cuts on this, so this would have to be the most expensive device and the most expensive total cost of ownership amongst all the different handhelds that we're talking about today. A small library of about four or five games for this can really set you back a couple hundred bucks. Now as for the tech specs of the Switch, the Switch has a 6.2 IPS touchscreen that has a resolution of 1280 by 720 or 720p essentially. Again, this screen is not the greatest even for today's standards, but it still gets the job done. And at its core, the Switch is powered by NVIDIA's Tegra X1 processor, which has a use of a custom ARM Cortex core, along with NVIDIA's Maxwell CUDA cores clocked at 1 gigs and 800 megs respectively. There is 4 gigabytes of RAM and 32 gigabytes of onboard storage. Now the Switch also comes with Wi-Fi that does support both 2.4 gigs and 5 gigs connection, something that neither the Vita or GXD's tablet does, and it also has Bluetooth, as well as a 4310 mAh battery that gets you about 2 to 4 hours of gameplay depending on your usage and your screen brightness levels. Now the form factor of the Switch is slightly thicker than about half an inch and it weighs around 297 grams. This is pretty comfortable to hold for folks with small to medium sized hands. Not so much for people with large hands as it can get uncomfortable after a while. The Joy-Con grips have a similar layout to that that you see on the Xbox with its offset joysticks and I actually really appreciate that. On the top you have two shoulder buttons on each side which are also frequently used in games and towards the bottom of the screen you have two speaker ports that produce decent sound. Now for connectivity, the Switch has a USB Type-C port on the underside used for the dock and charging, a micro SD slot tucked away behind its kickstand, a headphone jack on top alongside the cartridge slot for the games. The kickstand is very flimsy and you can really only use this on hard surfaces, otherwise you risk dropping or knocking over your Switch, which is not good. Now let's talk some of the unique or exclusive features that the Switch has that none of the other handhelds do. So the coolest thing about the Switch by far is that you have the ability to actually use this as a handheld, or you can go ahead and put it in its dock and have a full-on console experience. The Switch can also be turned into a tabletop gaming device for two people just by removing those Joy-Cons and you essentially have a multiplayer device ready to go without having to purchase anything in addition to that. You can also connect up to eight Switches using the built-in Bluetooth in ad hoc mode to play games such as Mario Kart. So how does emulation and homebrew look on the Switch? Now the Switch does have support for native emulation via the Nintendo's eShop. You can go ahead and download classic Nintendo titles and Super Nintendo titles if you want to do that. However, if you do hack the device, there's a lot of stuff that you can play with it that you couldn't just off of Nintendo's eShop. You'll be able to play PSP, PS1, Dreamcast, Nintendo DS, and even Virtual Boy games on the Switch. You'll also actually be able to stream your computer over to your Switch, which is kind of buggy right now, but it's still cool to know that you can actually do that. Now the Switch does handle emulation like a champ, and it doesn't sweat at running anything that you throw at it. In all respects, I'd say that the Switch is the best of the three in terms of emulation performance. 
However, there are still a few emulators that don't work well, such as ones that use Midway games, such as Mortal Kombat and other titles. But you can expect to see patches for that where it will work well, because we know that under the hood, the Switch has more than enough horsepower to go ahead and power those emulators and those games. Now let's talk about the games that are available on the Switch. The Switch currently has a pretty impressive library that is continuing to grow. It is, however, only two years old at the moment and doesn't really have a library currently like the PS Vita does or even the Android-based JXD. Now the outlook for the Switch looks very promising and we can expect to see some really good titles later this year and in the future coming years. And last but not least, what does customer service look like with Nintendo? Now Nintendo fully supports the Switch with its customer service and after doing more in-depth research, I uncovered that their service is actually really, really good. Nintendo is quick to help resolve with any issues and if you have a defective unit they'll send you out a replacement no questions asked. In some cases after digging through some forums I actually learned that customers who didn't even have warranty left on their devices were still able to get a replacement which speaks a lot for a company's policy on how they want to handle their product and how they treat their customers. So all in all I'd say this is exceptionally good customer service. Now last but not least since we've covered the Vita and we've covered the Switch let's talk about the JXD S192K and let's start off with the price and the total cost of ownership. So looking at the price the JXD is arguably one of the most expensive tablets that you can probably buy today that's made for emulation specifically with an Android operating system. Coming in at $300 and rarely seen on sale for around $250 to $260 this device is pretty expensive considering what all is under the hood of it. That being said, there are no games and additional costs that you'll have to pay after you purchase this. So once you go and spend that $300 or $260 on the GXT, you're not going to be really spending more money on games for it since most of it is really only emulation based or Android games. Again, if you want to go ahead and pay for some of those Android games, you can definitely do that as well. But I wouldn't say that any of those are super expensive when you compare them to the likes of the PS Vita or the Nintendo Switch. Now looking at the specs of the GXT S192, k it has a 7 inch IPS display with a pretty crisp 1080p display, the highest of all three devices. Powering this tablet is a Rockchip RK3288, which is an integrated quad core Cortex A12 core is clocked at 1.8 gigs and a Mali T760, so this is a SOC chip and that GPU is actually clocked at 600 megahertz. There's also 4 gigabytes of RAM and 64 GB built in storage. Now in terms of power, this device is more powerful than the Vita, but it's not as powerful as the Switch. The device also has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and a 5 megapixel front-facing camera. Powering this entire device is a 10,000 milliamp battery, which I've basically been able to squeeze 12 hours of consecutive use, which is more impressive than the other two combined. So it definitely has the best battery life. Now the form factor of the JXT is that it's the biggest device of the three and it's also the heaviest at 1200 grams. The built-in controller configuration makes this one of the most comfortable devices to use of all three. The tablet is actually very ergonomically designed and the screen portion is actually quite slim. The joypad follows a typical Xbox 360 layout for buttons, but it doesn't have the offset joysticks. The joysticks can also be pressed into function as L3 and R3 buttons as we see on the Xbox controller. And the controls also have both pairs of shoulder buttons, something that you don't have on the Vita. On the bottom of the tablet, there is a micro SD slot, a headphone jack, reset button, and of course a built-in microphone. And on the top, there is a mini HDMI output that you can connect this tablet to a bigger display. Now some of the unique features that the JXT handheld has that the other two don't is that this actually supports Miracast. So you can wirelessly display whatever it is that you're playing on your handheld on your TV. That being said, it isn't the most great experience given that the Wi-Fi in this is only a 2.4 gigs and the card that's being used in this is not the best. In addition to that, there are some pre-installed emulators that actually run really well out of the box. So once you open your box, there's little to no configuration that you have to do to get gaming right away on the go. In fact, there are even a few games that are preloaded onto the system. And there is an app called Happy Chick that you can access to download a bunch of different games for free. So this makes it pretty fun to just open the box and start playing right away. Now in terms of emulation, this handheld has an Android operating system and as a result it doesn't need to be hacked like the others to go ahead and support different platforms of games. It also comes pre-installed with a bunch of emulators for Nintendo DS, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, the PSP, PS1, and the Nintendo 64. You can also install Dreamcast, which works pretty great. One limitation, however, is that it does have an outdated Android OS. It's running Lollipop 5.1, which won't let you install Dolphin on it, so you can't play GameCube games on it. Now, in my tests, almost all the emulators ran extremely well, except for a few, notably the PS2 and the PSP emulators. 
However, after I did go in and tweak some of the settings in PPSSPP, I was able to get a pretty solid frame rate in some games, and that said, there are still a few games that don't run 100%, such as God of War. All in all, I'd say that this is really not a slouch in the emulation department, and you can play a ton of games on it right out of the box, which is not something that the Vita or the Switch can do without being hacked first. Now the games library of this handheld is pretty massive considering that it is running on an Android operating system. However, you're not going to get those console quality games like you would on a Nintendo Switch or a PS Vita. So with respect to that, I really wouldn't give the JXD a lot of credit for running an Android operating system and having those type of games. But there are a lot of people that are interested in those kind of games. So you can go ahead and pretty much consider that a benefit that you get with this device, that you can play a lot of Android games. And we know that there's a bunch of ports for different games such as PUBG. Now Fortnite being an example doesn't happen to run on this because it requires a newer version of Android, which this unfortunately does not have. You can however run PUBG and that actually works pretty well set at the lower graphics setting. Now let's talk about the customer service experience of JXC's handheld and there's absolutely no way for me to sugarcoat this for you guys and I'm going to be very honest, it is by far the crappiest of all three different handhelds that we talked about today. There's almost little to no support when you go ahead and reach out to them for anything and if you get a dud with your device, if something's wrong or something happens to it, they're probably not going to do anything. You can go ahead and read a bunch of forums of people who've purchased this device and have have had similar complaints. Personally, I have not had an opportunity to reach out to them, so I can't say from first-hand experience my basis on this or my view on this or scoring on this, whatever you want to call it, is solely based on what I read online in different forums such as Reddit of users who did go ahead and pick this up and experienced any kind of issues. Now that being said, since this is a Chinese manufactured handheld and you do have an issue with it, it's probably going to be impossible for you to go ahead and send it back to them and use it. So with that, my advice for anyone who is interested in this is to make sure you purchase it off of Amazon. That way you're at least covered for the first 30 days in case anything happens because they have a generous return policy and you can always send it back to them. So we've covered all the different features, the form factors, the tech specs, the emulation capabilities, and of course, the customer service of each of these handhelds. So let's just look at overall, what are some of the cons and pros of each? So let's talk the cons first. Now the Vita, straightforward, the memory card costs are insane. The game costs are pretty expensive. The accessories are expensive. There's a lack of dual shoulder buttons and clickable joysticks, which kind of makes some games hard to play unless you use a special grip for it. And the built-in Wi-Fi card is pretty weak for remote play unless you're really close to the vicinity of where your PlayStation is located. And last but not least, you're towards the end of life for this device. Now, if you look at the pros of the Vita, there are some pretty solid pros. It has really, really great battery life. It's by far the slimmest and lightest of all three devices, which means you can actually take this around with you wherever you want to go. There is an excellent library of games for it that include the PSP, PS1, and its own exclusive collection made by Sony. And the remote play capability of PS4 and PS3 works really great when you get it to work on a strong internet connection. It's pretty easy and free to hack and it's the cheapest of all three devices and has the lowest cost of ownership. And you also get multiple color options. Looking at some of the cons of the Switch, the cost for this is high and as well as the cost for the different games that you can purchase for it. The included Bluetooth doesn't actually allow you to connect a wireless headset with it like you can with the other two devices, which is kind of a bummer because it's sad that you have Bluetooth in there that you can't really use for other things, for anything other than connecting controllers to it or connecting another switch to it. And in addition to that, I find it kind of weird that you can't load any video files or audio files onto the SD card and actually play them locally on the switch, something that you can do with the Vita and the JXT handheld. And last but not least, the battery life I would say is pretty poor on the Switch coming in and my use at around two to three hours with medium brightness settings. They definitely could have done better in that area. But looking at the pro of the Switch, it is the most powerful of all three handhelds. It has excellent multiplayer support right out of the box. And you can use this as a console or a handheld, not something that you can really do with the others, despite the GXD handheld having a mini HDMI out. It also happens to run emulators and homebrew better than the other three handhelds. There are amazing exclusives that are only available on the Switch, such as the Zelda series, Mario, Donkey Kong, and Pokemon. Last but not least, guys, let's talk about some of the pros and cons of JXD's S192K. Coming in with the cons, like I mentioned, there is little to no support from the manufacturer if you have any issues with this. There's an outdated Android operating system, which is pretty incompatible with certain apps, and it's pretty expensive given its hardware configuration. So 
those are not maybe the biggest cons that you could think of. Now, when talking about the pros of it, the JXT does have the best screen of all three handhelds coming in at a full HD resolution. It has the longest battery life. It has a bunch of pre-installed emulators. There is the Miracast and Mini HDMI capability, which can allow you to throw this up on a screen. You're able to use apps like Steam Link, Moonlight, and Shadow that actually work exceptionally well on this device. The built-in controller is very comfortable, more so than any of the other three handhelds. This is my personal opinion because I do have larger hands. I just find it a lot more comfortable to hold this compared to holding, let's say, the Vita. And that's pretty important if you're gonna be gaming for a long time. And in addition to that, all the buttons that are on the actual JXT tablet, they get mapped automatically to games. So you don't have to go and manually do them unless there is an emulator that you're using that's outdated that doesn't happen to detect it. Most games will just detect it as an Xbox 360 controller and things just work flawlessly right out of the box. And the last pro for it is that it is an Android operating system at the end of the day, which means you can check your email on it, you can do internet browsing on it, you can watch Netflix on it, you can pretty much do anything with it that you would do with an Android tablet at the end of the day. Now I know that that's kind of an unfair pro given that the operating system of this is really open source and not something that Sony would ever put in their system or Nintendo would. But if you consider what Sony has in the Vita, it has pretty similar capabilities where you do have an email app, you do have a browser, and you also are able to play those files locally. Granted, you won't be able to install apps like Netflix. There's still stuff that you can do with this that, again, you can't do with Nintendo Switch. So of the three, Nintendo Switch really falls far behind the other two when it comes to having support for different apps like that and playing different things without actually having to hack it. Well, that pretty much sums up the pros and cons of each device. So which one is the actual ultimate winner in this case? And honestly, guys, I would have to say it really depends on you. Each one of these devices offers something unique that the other doesn't. There's some aspects of each that is much better than the other, but then there's some areas which they perform really poorly. To some people, actually to a lot of people, the GXD is not something that they would really want to purchase given that it's an Android device and you can't do certain things on that. However, between the Nintendo Switch and the PS Vita, it's always been a tough competition and a lot of folks that are diehard Sony fans would swear by the Vita over Nintendo Switch any day and of course vice versa. Now personally for myself, I like all three of these devices and I don't mean to give you a diplomatic answer. I like each and every single one of these for their specific reasons. As much as people hate on the JXT tablet, this is the only one that I use to stream different games from my computer onto it. I actually really, really enjoy that functionality with this more so than the other two, despite them being able to do a very similar thing. It's just much more comfortable on this, the screen is bigger, and it's a lot more easier to hold for me. That being said, it doesn't mean that this is my most favorite handheld. Each one of these handhelds have a specific place in my heart and in my gaming library for what I want to use. So what do you guys think? What's your favorite pick of these three? Which one would you guys choose to pick over these three? Let me know in the comments below and I'll definitely engage with you guys as I always do. As usual, let me know what you guys think about this content. If you did enjoy it, go ahead and smash that like button. And if you're new to this channel, eh, maybe subscribe. But guys, that's pretty much the end of this. I hope this was helpful to you in determining which device you should go and put your hard earned money towards. Do you want to go with something that's cheap and can get a lot of stuff done? Do you want to go with something that has a pretty good set of unique features? Or do you want to go with something that has, you know, the lowest cost of overall ownership, even though it's expensive device itself, but has the most pretty screen and can do streaming really, really well. The choice really depends on you. So until then guys, I will see you on my next video and as always, stay smiling.